you would, you can take your Bibles. If you're visiting with us, then just go out. Oh, there's Jordan. Jordan's like, oh, geez, baby. Yeah. Be prepared, Jordan, be prepared. <clears throat> if you're visiting with us, that black Bible in the chair in front of you, you pull that out, and then you go to page 651. We're going to study Amos chapter 3. English chapter 3, big number 3, little number 9, the Black Bible. Um, start at the beginning, go to page 651. 651, you'll find, uh, find Amos chapter 3. We're going to study verses 9. Then we'll go all the way to the end of chapter 4, 4, 13. So 3, 9 through 4, 13. 3, 9 through 4, 13. That's what we're going to study this morning. And what I'll do is, as I've done before, just I'll read it, the text, and then we'll dive in from the passage this morning. Chapter 3, you're starting in verse 9. Proclaim on the citadels in Ashton, and on the citadels in the land of Egypt, and say, Assemble yourselves in the mountains of Samaria, and see great tumults within her, and oppressions in her midst. But they do not know how to do what is right, declares the Lord, these who hoard of violence and devastation in their citadels. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an enemy, even one surrounding the land, will pull down your strength from you, and your citadels will be looted. Thus says the Lord, just as the shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or a piece of an ear, so will the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria be snatched away with the corner of a bed and the cover of a couch. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the Lord, the God of hosts. For on the day that I punish Israel's transgression, I will also punish the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and they will fall to the ground. I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house, the houses of ivory will also perish, and the great houses will come to an end, declares the Lord. Hear this word, starting in chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks, and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through the breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you'll be cast to Haram, declares the Lord. Verse 4. Enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering also from that which is leaven, and proclaim free will offerings. Make them known, for so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. But I gave you also cleanness of teeth and all your sins, and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 7. And furthermore, I withheld the rain from you, while still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water but would not be satisfied. Yet you've not returned to me, declares Yahweh. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. Yet you've not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze, yet you have not returned to me, declares Yahweh. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I shall do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts. He who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. It's all about me. In 
Have you heard that before? Have you ever done a Google search on All About Me? It's quite interesting. I did that this past week. Just type in Google search All About Me. This is what I found. I found a book called All About Me. Seriously, there's a book called All About Me. There's also a salon and day spa in Maryland called All About Me. And I thought this was the best one. Even a clothing store online called All About Me. And this is what it states, quote, a contemporary clothing store featuring the latest fashion trends from the streets of New York and Los Angeles. It's all about me, so you ladies want to be in a clothing store. We don't seem to have a problem with us saying it's all about me. And yet we seem to get upset. Some of us even get angry when we, when God wants it to be all about him. When God is the one who says, no, it's really all about me. We get upset over that. We, 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 we get frustrated. We say, well, that's arrogant. God can't do that. And yet we can. No, it's really all about me, says the Lord. Is this right? Well, if all creation is meant to give God the glory, then it really is all about Him, isn't it? Amen. And it is about what He wants from us. It is about the fact that we must make Him everything in our lives. We must make Him the focus of our lives. And as we're working through this book here, the book of Amos, we're seeing how God cares. He cares about this world. He cares about what's happening in this world. Yes, he does. And how much does he care? So much he justly judges with warnings, with mercy, and with hope. He will judge. He'll always do it with warnings. He'll always do it with having mercy. And he'll always do it with hope at the end. And today, specifically from a passage that we looked at from our reading this morning, we're going to see how God cares that we have a heart for him. God cares that we have a heart for him. We will see from the passage that Yahweh God wants us to have a heart for him, that we make him the focus of our lives, that we make him, it's all about him in our lives. And we're going to see it in light of what Israel did not do. They did not make God the focus of their lives. They did not have a heart for the Lord. They failed to do that. The northern kingdom, the Yankees, as we classify them, the northern kingdom, they failed to do that. They did not do that, and they were going to face judgment. And as we go through the text, you can begin to ask yourself, do I desire him above everything else? My health, money, prestige, power? Do I regard God above everything and anything else? Everyone and everything else. Do I have a passion for him? Is it all about him in my life? You can ask yourself that question as we look at seven ways to know that you have a heart for God. How do you know if you have a heart for God? What does it mean to have a heart for God? How do you know you have a heart for God? Now, there's probably other ways, not just seven. But from our text this morning, we will observe seven and the first way we see is we truly love each other. We truly love each other. We're going to look at chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 in just a moment. This is the first way, how, how we can know that we have a heart for God. Again, there's probably other ways, but from our text this morning, there's seven that we can see. And the first way is we truly love people. And, and even more specific, a person who has a heart for the Lord will have a heart for other people particularly his own people. And for us in the 21st century, the church, the body of Christ. I will go into verse 9 and 10 as, you're, if you, or as you are writing. It says, Proclaim on the citadels in Ashton, which stands for the Philistines, and so those citadels in the land of Egypt. So these nations... They're called the witness, the oppression that's happening in Samaria, in the northern kingdom of Israel. 
Egypt, remember, they were the ones, they, 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 they were slaves in Egypt. And the Philistines were the constant nag. And the Lord is calling them to witness oppression. It says, see the great tumults within her and oppressions in her midst. They don't know how to do what's right. These are horrible violence and devastation in their fortresses. Oppression that even these pagan nations had not seen. Even they would be shocked at what Israel was doing to their own people. It wasn't things that they were doing uh, to other nations, necessarily. They were doing this to their own people. They were violent just like you and even more so. And they were, the Lord was telling them, stand at the top of the fortresses and proclaim a guilty message. Interesting how it amplifies irony as well. The Gentile nations who don't know Yahweh God or his law, they're called to participate in condemning Israel. God's covenant people. This is amazing. These gentle nations are the ones doing that? Yeah. And they are. You know, it's shameful when the unsaved criticize the way we live. It's shameful for us. They criticize the way we live in, in sin. But we're not truly loving each other within the church. They plundered the storehouses and took it by murderous violence. They subjugated the masses, controlling the wealth, and then they kept them in a state of control by fear. That's what they were doing. Notice the word tumults, great tumults. They violently extorted the people in their great tumults, and they're leaving them in confusion. The idea is of violence, and they gained money through unjust practices of their own people. And it was so bad, they plundered and looted their own people so bad, not an enemy, the concept of right and wrong was completely blurry. They didn't even know how to do what was on us. They failed both in their character and their conduct. They had so far departed from the Mosaic law that they allowed people to live selfishly and luxuriously. They exploited others, engaged in personal and sensual pleasures. They insulted, they assaulted people. They abused them. They abused their property. Let's ask ourselves this question. As we're talking about having a heart for the Lord, these questions, I should say. In what ways have you not shown love to members of this church? How can you love them more? It's hard to love people as you get to know them more, isn't it? Huh. It's kind of on the exterior. It's like, oh, yeah, that's it. You get to know them more, it's like, oh, I don't like that they're that way, right? And that's when people want to just bail. Two more aspects to bring up, too, that they're not up on the screen. <clears throat> First of all, that's how people are going to know that we're Jesus' disciples. It's not by how much social justice that you do, but it's how the church loves each other. How they see a bunch of people or so different, caring for each other. That stands out. That's what Jesus said in John, in the Gospel of John. They'll know you're Christians by your love for each other. But another aspect is, is corporate evangelism. As we live holy lives, we are testifying to the message that we proclaim. So that's why, if you want to have a heart for the Lord, you want to have a heart for God, you're going to be a person truly loving His people. You will love other people. A second one, how we know that we have a heart for God is we let go of the world's things. We let go of the world's things. You see that in chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Also should say verse 15 or 2. In verse 15, we'll look at that too. 11 and 12, judgment will, will come upon the land, upon the people, upon their luxurious living. It says, therefore... The Lord God says, an enemy even when surrounding the land will pull down your strength. Your citadels will be looted. This would be a shocking statement for them. See, they trusted in their external defenses, 
when the condition of their heart was of greater importance, they thought it was so great that they had all these fortresses. They were so prosperous. Remember, this was a time Israel was very prosperous, second to Solomon. So they're prospering, things are going great. And they're saying, what? We're, we're, we're going to be destroyed? You're crazy. They were just looking at the exterior. They were not looking at their hearts. God wanted their heart. God wanted their devotion. God wanted their commitment. God wanted them. Notice it says uh, there in verse 12, thus says the Lord, that the shepherd snatches from the legs, line, excuse me, from the lion's mouth a couple of legs with a piece of an ear. So the sons of Israel go in and be snatched. The corner of a bed and the cover of a couch. In that time period, the shepherd would retrieve the remains of an animal who was attacked. Kind of disgusting, but that's how you know it died. You have proof to that. There's a piece of here, a piece there. See, look, it's dead. Everybody goes, okay, we can see that. Thank you. So, what is he saying? The broken remains of Israel would witness to its total destruction. All that would remain of the luxuries would be a small piece of the bed, the cover of the couch. These luxurious things would just be a piece. Uh, like if somebody had, was, uh, if you've ever been in a fire, or, or you see there on TV on a tornado, and people are going through their stuff, and they'll, they'll find a little piece of their couch, or maybe a broken uh, picture frame, part of it is missing. That's the idea. That's what they would find left over. There'd be nothing left, just small little pieces. God was going to break them. Because God wanted their heart. He wanted their devotion. He wanted them. God will do what he needs to do to strip away our trust in the things of this world to see that he is our ultimate need. And he should be first and foremost is God first and foremost in your life? You will strip away the things in the world. So that you see your ultimate need is Him. In verse 15, He says, I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house. Interesting, they had two houses. A winter house and a summer house. That's how rich they were. The house of ivory also perished. Every house will come to an end because of war. These expensive homes will be destroyed. And he's not saying the beautiful houses are inherently evil. He's not saying that. It was through oppression that they had these things. Unfair practices. Violence. That's how they built these houses. That's how they got the money to build these houses. They misused their wealth and power to suppress the weak and the powerless. They were monuments of selfishness is what they were. See, it's not that God thinks it's wrong to be rich. That's what people think. It's wrong for that person to be rich. That person should be rich. That's wrong. They, they did that. Why is that wrong for a person to be rich? That's not wrong. It's not wrong for a person to be rich. But how did the person obtain the wealth? <coughs> and how much does that person give? James Rickard said this. When you are generous, money becomes less important. When you are stingy, money is the center of your life. How much do you give of your time and resources to others? How much do you cling to the world's things? Is the things of this world, people, things of this world, are they everything to you? Sports? Money? Your new little gadget? You being popular, your status, TV. What are the things that appeal to your flesh and appeal to your eyes? What are those things? See, someone who has a heart for the Lord, you're, you let go of the things of this world. You let go of those things because you want God. You, you want to cling to Him. You want Jesus alone. Is, is that what you do? Is that what we do? Can people know that from us? You want a heart for God. That's what you'll do. You'll love others. You'll let go of the things of this world. Number three, you won't practice self-indulgence either. If you have a heart for the Lord, you won't practice self-indulgence. This is a negative one. I tried to take all this. Did you notice Amos is kind of a negative book, right? Did you kind of notice that? It's really negative. On purpose. It gets positive at the very, very end. 
There's a little positive here and there, but mostly at the very end is very positive. So I'm trying to put this in more of a positive swing instead of a negative swing, but rightly so. But here's a negative statement for you. How do you know you have a heart for the Lord? You won't practice self-indulgence. And that's where you come to chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. The rich who live carefree lives haven't obtained the money from oppression in unfair ways. They were into themselves. Notice. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Cows. I thought he was talking about people here. So if any of you have a cow from Bashan, you're in sin, and you should sell it today. No, that's not what he's saying. Notice that you can let the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Interesting. That's a little side note. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, oh, now we know who he's talking about. He's talking about wives. Bring now that we may drink. You gotta understand, Bashan, the area, it was, it was pasture land, which is great. I mean, just tremendous pasture land. Great place for cattle. I'm just you would just love it. It'd be heaven for you, right? And the cows were plump and juicy, right? Steak was, ah, all right, double thumbs up. So what, is, what does Amos do here? Um, by the word of the Lord, Amos sarcastically likened the arrogant women to fat grazing cows. I'm not doing that, ladies. I'm not doing that. I'm just a messenger. And what he's saying is that they live luxuriously, they live comfortable lives because they crushed the poor. They oppressed their own people, insisting and demanding luxuries. They were guilty of their responsibility, not just towards their inferiors, these people were poor, but also notice to their superiors, to their husbands. They abused and misused for their own personal profits. They arrogantly dominated the household. They wore the pants in the family. They insisted on instant gratification. They were domineering. Can I graciously say something by way of application for you ladies? Wives, be warned if you wear the pants in the family. Be warned. This is what Amos is likening what's happening here in the northern kingdom. Be warned, ladies. And notice he takes it very seriously. God cares about this in verse 2. The Lord has sworn by his holiness. Which means his uniqueness, his separation from his creation. He's saying, I'm not like you. That's what he means when he's holy. I'm distinct. I don't lie. Judgment will come because you violated my holiness. See, here are his people. I am a holy, distinct God. I'm separate. You should be separate. You should be distinct. You are my people, and yet you're not acting like that. So I swear by my holiness, days are coming upon you, and they'll take you away with meat hooks, and the last of you with fish hooks. The women will be led in such a humiliating, horrible way through the breached wall of Samaria. They'll be led into exile in complete disgrace, and We'll just tell you what this means. Their dead bodies will be picked up like meat and thrown away. <coughs> and when they led captives, they led the captives by cords and they attached hooks to their lips. So they pull them by the cords and all the women would be standing there with their lips and they had to move because you had a hook in it. That's what they did. That's what happened. Where he says, You will go out through the breach, you will go through breaches in the walls, each one straight before it, and be cast to Harmon. They don't know the location of Harmon, but they do know it was done by Assyria. Assyria came in and did this. A feeble, what's it mean, future was more terrible upon them than the agony that they were putting on the poor people. They would see the wealth stolen, their comforts ruined. Because they were indulging in themselves. Are you indulging in yourself? I mean, should we not be a people who show self-denial? 
should be not being like that. Uh, he, the words of Jesus, remember he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Remember that? That's what Jesus said. Kind of a positive way to put that, instead of saying we should not practice self-indulgence, we should practice self-denial. That's what we should be about, right? If you want to have a heart for the Lord, you don't practice self-indulgence. You are denying yourself. You love, you let go of the Lord's things. You practice self-denial. And four, you practice true religion. You practice true religion. Israel was known for their idolatrous false religion. That's why the Lord, bam, just hit them with this big time. In three, chapter 3, verse 14, going back to chapter 3, it says, For on the day that I punished Israel's transgression, I will also punish the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off. They will fall to the ground. The altars of Bethel was destroyed. Remember, Bethel was an important place. Abraham camped near Bethel. God appeared to Jacob in Bethel. And he named it Bethel. House of God is what it means. They housed the Ark of the Covenant later on in Israel's history there in Bethel. And the northern kingdom, it became one of two cities where Jeroboam I, he placed a golden calf. 1 Kings chapter 12. He had a great idea. Jeroboam had a great idea. The northern kingdom said, Judah, you're, we're not with you anymore. We're done. See you later. He went up north. And Jeroboam, he became their king. He had a great idea. He said, you know what? I don't want them to go back down to Judah and worship in Jerusalem. They might turn their hearts back to Judah. I know. I have a great idea. I'm going to make two golden calves. I'm going to put one in Bethel, which is toward the southern part of their kingdom. One in Dan, which is in the northern part. And then he said... Here, O Israel, is the Lord who delivered you out of Egypt. Idolatry. That's what he did. And the northern kingdom of Israel followed that all the way down. They worshiped the idolatry. They, they, they were violating the first commandment. And here he says, you have your altars, you have your little religious ritual. I'm going to knock that down to because this is false religion. This is not true religion. This, this tells us something. It tells us that religious observance alone does not please God. We cannot rely on our religious ritual. God wants our heart. Should, should you be at a church service as good? Yes. As, especially as a member of First Southern? Yes, you should. Would it be good for you to go to a gospel group? Yes, that's where you get to know other people. You get more connected with the church. Yes, that's true. But you cannot say, well, I've done this, I've done this, so now I'm good to go. If you think that way, you've lost it. You're not getting it. God wants your heart. And these are just vehicles by which you can, he can have your heart. That's why we have a church service. That's why you have preaching. That's why you have singing. It's the means to the end. What's the end? That God has your heart. That's the end. If you just go to these things and God doesn't have your heart, that's false religion. That's not, that's not true. You're living a lie. <coughs> it's our heart that God wants. If you go to chapter 4, verse 4, so you're writing, I'll just read that again. It says, enter Bethel and sin. What? Enter Bethel. So you're going to worship God and sin? Is that what that's saying? And Gilgal, multiply transgression. Yeah, the chief religious sanctuary in the north was Bethel. And actually, Gilgal it replaced Dan later on in their history. Jerusalem was a place where God was going to dwell. Jerusalem was a place where you're supposed to worship God. Not these, this alternative place. This action was supposed to please God. It was supposed to worship Him. It did just the opposite. They didn't please God. They didn't want to please God. 
Remember when we talked about this? Syncretism? Syncretistic worship is what it was. Remember when we talked about this? Yahweh God, uh, they combined Yahweh worship with the Canaanite religion. They took a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when you go out to eat a fast food restaurant, you know, they have Coca-Cola, they have uh, orange soda, they have Sprite, they have all these different, you get a, what's called a suicide. You get a little bit of this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. That's what we used to call it suicide in junior high school. So you know, get all that, you drink it, and you feel kind of weird, you know, so you get all those drinks. But that's, that was the idea. This was how they worshiped the Lord. We want to worship the Lord, and then also this Canaanite religion, and then this Canaanite religion, this Canaanite religion. We just put it all together. That's how they worshiped the Lord. It was false. They put everything together. The syncretism. They had an external allegiance to these little ritual requirements. They want to fulfill the obligation. But there was no covenant obligation. Notice it says in verse 4, bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Individual sacrifices in a year's tithe is what it was talked about in the Old Testament. Actually, it was supposed to be every third year. But they did it every morning, and they did it every three days. Oh, now we're really good. Oh, we're doing awesome now. Yeah. Simply having a religious ritual to gain approval for God just, just doesn't cut it. Ritual worship was ineffective. So not only did they worship at the wrong place in the wrong way, but they worshiped with the wrong behavior. They were doing it all wrong. This worship was not acceptable to Yahweh at all. Not only were they worshiping a, a, a sacrifice to a, some god of their own making, their worship was even more false because they were oppressing their own people. We had two strikes against them. False religion, this idolatrous religion, and then they're sitting there doing all these rituals saying, oh, we're good because we do it all like this, and yet they're at the same time they're oppressing their own people and they're ripping them off. Notice verse 5 of chapter 4. Offer a thank offering also from that which is left. And proclaim free will offerings. Make them known. For so you love to do, O Israel. You know what's interesting? They only did voluntary sacrifices. They never did sacrifices for sin. Or repentance. And then the meat that they would consume was for them. They never gave it to the poor people. Is that interesting? And notice he says, you just love to do this, don't you? They didn't really love Yahweh. They, they didn't really love their neighbor. They loved their sacrificial system. Why? Because it made them feel good. That's why. All the while excusing themselves from their unrighteous living. All the while excusing themselves from their false religion. You don't want to be self-pleasing, uh, self-praise. You want to feel better about yourself, right? It, wasn't it James who said, this is true and undefiled religion? To visit, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, to keep oneself unstained by the world, that's true religion. Holiness, caring for others. They were doing the exact opposite. But we come to a church service because we want to feel better about ourselves, right? I don't want to feel guilty anymore. I want to feel better about myself, right? Because this is your best life now, right? Friends, some people need to feel guilty at a church service. They need to. We have to understand something. We cannot gain God's approval through sacrifice. God requires total obedience. Complete and total obedience. And that's what Jesus did. Completely obeyed the law for sinners, and he dies as a substitute for sinners. So you turn and trust in him. God requires complete obedience. You cannot please God. That's the problem. The Father's love for his people is not secure in your performance, it's secure in the performance of Jesus. Don't think you can gain God's approval. True religion goes back to you truly trusting in Jesus and then living out the way that you live. That's true religion. So you're loving people, you're letting go of the world's things, you're practicing self-denial, 
You are practicing true religion. Number five, we have repentant attitudes. We have repentant attitudes. Here we break into a huge section, 6 through 11, where it became the most serious section, not necessarily because of their crimes and their rebellion, although those things are true, and their false religion. It was a fact that they didn't repent and they were given a chance to do that. Here you see God's eminence in history. Remember, remember, history is really his story, his story, his story. That's history. It's his story. How God works in time and works with people. And here you see in 6 to 11, terrible catastrophes by a loving, merciful God to warn his people of their sin, to warn them of certain judgment. And yet it kept saying, yet you've not returned to me, yet you've not returned to me, yet you've not returned to me. God is willing these bad things for his glory so his people repent. And if you want a heart for God, if you want a heart for, you want to have a heart for God, if you have a heart for God, you will be a person who's always repenting. Because you realize that's what you need to do. There's seven happenings, seven different aspects. Famine, drought, blight, locusts, plague, war, disaster. It was used to motivate the people to repent. To avoid a greater catastrophe. Interesting, in verse 6, it talks about cleanness of teeth. When you have clean teeth, it means you're not eating. You're not eating. That's why your teeth are clean. You don't have to brush your teeth because you ain't eating. If you did that, they didn't listen. They didn't listen. There was drought for three months before the harvest. There was drought, which would destroy the crops. They didn't listen. Blight and mildew. Crop disease would take place there in verse 9. And then the locusts, or in a caterpillar form, was the locust. He would eat all the crops and he had crop pests. They didn't listen. Notice in verse 10, I said, Plague among you after the manner of Egypt. A pestilence that would come upon just like it did in Egypt. They didn't listen. I slew your young men there in verse 10 by the sword. <coughs> slaughtered their young men. They slaughtered the captured horses. So that the smell from the decaying carcasses would reach their nostrils. They didn't listen. They didn't persuade them. And then in verse 11, I overthrew you like Sodom and Gomorrah. The violence suffered by these cities, equivalent to Sodom and Gomorrah, when I destroyed them. The most extreme. You obliterated the cities. It became a sign of what God was going to do. And notice it says there in verse 11, and you were like a firebrand snatched from the blaze. You ever had a fire going and then you, you put this log, put that log, and you put that log, and you go, oh, I don't want that log in. And you snatch it out real fast. You ever done that before? That's the idea. The fire, it's, it's, it's snatched from the fire. These towns would have been destroyed forever if it were not for God's rescuing grace. He was gracious to you. But... You still did not return to me, says the Lord. God's grace spared them. So what were they going to do? Will they finally repent? This is the moment of decision. You're going to see next week in chapter 5, what the Lord said, seek the Lord. Seek him. Come to him. Why won't you come? He's pleading with me. If you repent, there's God's sovereign grace. So step in. If you harden your heart, his judgment will come in like a flood. You know, praise God. Praise God that we live in the new covenant, not in the old covenant. Because in the old covenants, because they were disobedient, they would face judgment. In the new covenant, judgment has been made, and Jesus was the one who embraced that, that judgment for us. You know what I mean? But as followers of Jesus, as those have a heart for the Lord, we must have an attitude of repentance. So here's some questions we can ask ourselves. What do we need to repent of? 
And what do we need to repent of as a church? Do we need to repent of apathy? Cynicism? A lack of passion for the loss? Discipleship? A lack of passion for outreach, for missions, for ministry? To repent of in the giving of our resources, giving of our time? What do we need to repent of to have God's blessing again here for Sunday? we need to repent of. And when we come this Wednesday, as you are considering what we need to repent of, and thinking about that, keep in mind verses 6 through 11 of chapter 4 of Amos, that God wants us to have attitudes of repentance, that's what he wants, and that we should have a heart for him. What do we need to repent of? You personally, individually, and us as a congregation, holistically. Two more. Number six, we endure his discipline. Do you have a heart for the Lord to endure? You could even say we embrace his discipline. And that's one verse, chapter four, verse 12. It says, therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I shall do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. And thus I will, what, what, what is thus? In the same which makes it worse. In other words, he's basically saying, I haven't seen anything yet again. And when he does this judgment, they will definitely meet their maker. Not in a face-to-face -face pleasurable encounter, but face-to-face -face judgment. He was telling them, prepare. Prepare for the calamity that's about to come upon you. The God who created all of mankind and the world, he cares about justice and righteousness and truth. Just like he overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to do this to you. And you know what they saw it? They saw it happen. They saw God. They didn't see God through some spectacular lightning storm or anything. You know when they saw the Lord? When it says, prepare to meet your God? You know how they met him? When they saw the Assyrians come in and slaughter your family in front of your face, and then the Assyrian comes right towards you and kills you on the spot, then you're looking at the face of God. Isn't that amazing? You see God in horror? This is what the saying. Yes, friend, something terrible. You don't hear this today, do you? When's the last time you heard that you see the face of God with somebody being slaughtered before your very eyes? You don't hear that today, do you? You hear that God is love, and he's sappy, he's emotional, right? That's what you hear. God is love, and God is holy. God is merciful, and yet God is strong. Amen. God cares, and God really cares. It matters. For us, in the New Covenant, as an aspect of His grace, God disciplines us, doesn't He? He disciplines us. Why? Because He wants to bring us back to Him. It's one of the reasons why we suffer. We suffer because he wants to bring us back to him. And we must be mindful that we, we don't become spiritually hardened to these things. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, Lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Stay soft to God's will. Stay soft to God's word. The Lord is the cause of our circumstances. His purpose in every affliction is for his glory. And to bring his people back to him, glorifying his name. He's at work to bring us closer to himself. Remember, 
God wants our heart. So repent if there is sin. Run to him to find comfort. Draw near to God in a relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, and draw near to him with humility, and he will draw near to you. He will embrace his discipline, embrace the fact when he, things are going in our life and, and things happen, and you don't know why. Maybe there's sin, maybe there's not. But God's trying to get your attention. God takes very seriously the way we move. So much so that for some Christians, if they continue to spurn him and the way that they live, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, God killed them. He does that. They get sick and they die. He takes it very seriously. God cares, right? He cares about the way we live. He cares that we have a heart for him. Mm-hmm. Remember, he wants your heart. And when he has your heart, the last thing that characteristic will have is we'll give him the glory he deserves. We'll give him the glory he deserves. Just one verse in chapter 3, and then the last verse of chapter 4, they coincide. And we'll see why in a moment. Here and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts. House of Jacob, this is their heritage, this is your promise, you're the covenant people. You've rebelled against the Lord. You forfeited your right to be blessed upon. When they're on trial, Yahweh has called witnesses to see the evidence against his people. And notice it says, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts. Lord Sabaoth. Lord Sabaoth, his name is why we say mighty fortresses are God. The Lord of hosts. It means he's a sovereign ruler. The sovereign, he's sovereign over all the armies of heaven and earth. He has complete rulership. You should give him the glory he deserves. He deserves to, for you to focus on him. He deserves that you worship him. He deserves that you give him the honor that he deserves. He deserves that. And then in chapter 4, verse 13, he goes even more depth on who this God is. It's, it's almost like a hymn here in verse 13, like a song. The one who formed the mountain and creates the wind. He's the mountain former and the wind creator. And notice it says, and declares to man what are his thoughts. You can take this two ways. It could be his thoughts, God's thoughts. Declares to man what are God's thoughts. Or it can be declares to man what are man's thoughts. I think it's this one. He declares to us our thoughts. He shows us our intentions. He makes known the motivations of your heart. He reveals them. It says, who makes dawn into darkness. Darkness here stands for judgment. Because they are all so happy and everything. Prosperous. He'll take that dawn and he'll move it into darkness. The day of luxury will turn to the dreaded night. Look, it says, he treads on the high places of the earth. He strides over the hills and mountains. In, in Micah chapter 1, verse 3, it, it uses the same term, he treads upon the mountains. And as soon as his feet would touch the mountains, they melt like wax. That's how great that he is. It shows his sovereign rulership over the whole earth. So here is the one who forms everything. The creator, the revealer, the maker, the treader, the one who controls everyone and everything. He answers no. But the universe answers to him. And it says that at last part, verse 13, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Lord Sabaoth. His vast power and authority over heaven and earth. His sovereign. He created the world. He sustains the world. He directs all of history because it's his story. He reveals your motivations. He judges. He is the covenant-keeping God. He holds your lives in the very palm of his hand. And you spurred him, Israel. And was fulfilled. God showed his greatness by having the Assyrian army come and destroy them. But friends, the same devastation will accompany the day of the Lord at the end of the age when Jesus returns 
and he steps and treads upon the mountains and they melt like wax. He will return. And one writer said this, every believer can take comfort in the fact that while sometimes it seems that God does not interfere in human affairs, the world is never out of his control. He's Lord Sabaoth. He's sovereign. God truly cares about this world. He cares about what's happening in the world right now. He cares about what's happening in your life right now. So, do you give God the glory he deserves? Or is it all about you? Is it all about what you want? How you want things to be? What you think the way things should be? Are you still soft to God's word? Are you going back to the gospel? What you deserve? And you see God's great mercy to you in the cross? Does your life match what you believe? When you embrace the circumstances that God has in your life right now, because God's doing so you can have your heart. God wants your heart. Here are the seven ways that we can know. There's others. Seven specific ways we can know that we have a heart for the Lord. So we go to our time of pondering about God's word this morning. Think about those things. And they, God, penetrate your heart. And as, he do, as he's doing that, we'll just take a few moments of silence and then we'll keep worshiping.